hold on here. Uh, there's my contact information. My name is Tim Reynolds. I'm a CPA here in uh, Hickory, North Carolina. For those of you who don't know where Hickory is, that's near Charlotte. Um, my phone number, email address are there. Uh, if you have any questions, any follow-ups, uh, or like a copy of the presentation after today, uh, please feel free to uh, give me a call or send me an email and I will be glad to uh, get that to you. Um, here at DHW, I am the practice leader for our retail and manufacturing industries. The retail industry encompasses uh, dealerships. Um, I also manage the FET hotline for the NTDA. So uh, when you call that, you get me. Um, chances are good. I've probably talked to some of you uh, along the way um, throughout the years, um, and uh, hopefully I've helped you out and uh, got you in a good spot with uh, FET questions. Um, Let's go ahead and switch here. Okay, so today, uh, like I said, we will cover section 4053. It is not a very big section. It's not the cure for insomnia by any means. Um, the trailers that we are talking about today are uh, pretty narrow. Um, not a lot of these uh, that I come across that I really have many questions on. Um, but what it does is it provides uh, certain exemptions from FET on certain types of bodies, parts, and other items. Um, there's various things in here, but we will focus on the mobile machinery exemption. That seems to be the most um, prevalent um, uh, concept here under the section, or the, under the code section. Uh, it's, it's usually the most scrutinized as well by the IRS. So you have to be very, very careful when you're relying upon this code section uh, when you have uh, when determining a taxable versus a non-taxable unit. From there, we'll switch gears and go into the off-highway use exemptions, and we'll talk about the special design and substantial impairment tests that uh, you'll need to navigate through as well. So depending on what exemption here you're looking at to use, um, I will get you in a good spot, hopefully with this information, and uh, you can go from there. Uh, like I said, we'll focus on 4053 first, and under this section, I mean, you're probably used to giving an exemption certificate or having somebody sign something or get some kind of documentation in the deal file. There's really no exempt certificate or special registrations to substantiate these uh, exempt sales. So nothing out there you need to have signed, documented. Um, what I would suggest is if you do, and this is with just about any exempt sale you make, is if you are selling exempt, make sure you have documentation or research in there as to the why. Um, generally speaking, when the IRS comes in, they will look at uh, all your exempt transactions and you'll be required to support that uh, reason why you sold exempt, either with an exemption certificate or something uh, research in the deal file to say, hey, here's why we did not charge FET on it. The first one here is probably the most common and it's probably one of the most common ones I've seen dealers get tripped up on. Uh, farmers are great people, but they're very notorious for thinking they're exempt on a lot of things and a lot of times they are, um, but sometimes they're wrong. And what will happen is They'll come in and try to buy a trailer and say, I'm going to use this for farm. And they say, well, there's a farm feed, seed and fertilizer exemption. Well, that's fine. There is. But understand that the body has to be primarily designed for these. And it has to meet one of these four or five here exemptions. Um, so per, to process, to haul it, to spread it, to load it, to unload it, um, feed, seed, fertilizer on the farms or any combination thereof. Those will qualify, but again, it has to be primarily designed. And what I mean by that is if you have a trailer that is specifically designed to haul or spread or process any of this stuff, that's great. But if you sell a standard trailer that you can haul feed and seed fertilizer on one day, mulch in it on Tuesday, gravel Wednesday, sand on Thursday, that's a problem. That's not going to meet this exemption. So be very, very careful with this. Um, I think those of you who are probably selling these in industry know which ones these are, um, but it's just not a standard trailer. Um, and again, make sure if you are selling exempt, make sure your marketing materials support this these functions. So um, in any examination, the IRS will also, they'll you'll say, hey, you know, I've got this trailer. 
um, you know, it's designed to haul feed and seed and fertilizer. But if they go to your showroom and they pull out guidance that you have that says, oh, it can haul, you know, gravel and mulch too, um, that's not a good optic. And you're probably going to be um, in trouble at the IRS on that. So again, be very careful. Make sure those marketing materials support um, those exempt sales. These here are very common or not very common. I don't see um, with the trailer dealers as much, but house trailers, ambulance hearses, camper coaches, concrete mixers, um, those are all exempt um, as well. Uh, trash containers, you know, your typical box containers, receptacle bins designed as be a trash container, not designed to transport really freight other than the garbage or the trash that gets put in it. Um, not designed to be permanently mounted. Um, those can be sold exempt all day. Um, so those no, there are no issues there. Uh, rail trailers, rail vans. These are I haven't seen these in a long time. I don't know if they're even still out there, but um, there is an exemption for this. But it's a, a trailer that can be used as a rail car and a and a trailer on the highway. Um, those are going to be generally exempt here um, as well. So I talked about this a little bit earlier. So what? what is mobile machinery and and this is the big area of 4053 that you got to be careful of so uh, really there's a couple there's three things here um, the first one is any vehicle which consists of a chassis that has permanently mounted equipment okay and it could be welded on it could be bolted on riveted however you want to put it on there um, and it it generally has to meet some kind of processing uh, function in connection with manufacturing or construction so you think about it, it'd be like cranes or uh, drills or whatever they might put on these trailers to basically perform a processing uh, function, whether it be at a quarry or a, a, a lumber yard or in the forest or wherever they might put these things. Um, but that trailer has to be um, has to have that machinery on it and permanently mounted. Um, you know, just because it can transport it off the public highway means nothing. You know, it's more of, you know, what's on this thing. And and it's really unrelated to, you know, whether it can travel over the road for the most part. The second thing here is it needs to be specially designed. OK, so it has to be really serve as that mobile carriage mount power source where applicable. Um, for that machinery or that equipment involved, um, whether it's in operation or not. So um, again, it has to, you know, be, it can't just take a normal trailer and throw something on it. I mean, it has to be, um, has some kind of uh, uh, mechanisms or some kind of construction that really shows that, hey, this thing cannot do anything else. Um, it is solely dedicated to this machinery. And the last one here, the third thing, it kind of, um, follows along the number two is due to that special design, um, you really couldn't do anything else with it without substantial structural modification. So, you know, you wouldn't want to turn one of these trailers that are have traditionally been dedicated to a piece of machinery. You really wouldn't want to turn it into a reefer unit or a box car. Um, Cause it with, cause the, the modifications, the, the rework, the, would be so substantial it just wouldn't be worth your time so again um, these three tests are what the irs will look to when you are kind of asserting this exemption for um, these types of trailers that you're selling so um, no special order um, just you know you got to meet all three and that's probably the biggest thing you got to understand um, the exemption um, assumes it's roadworthy. It focuses on the chassis, whether it's limited to solely the transportation, to the job site equipment, um, the loading and unloading of cargo. Now, this is um, <laughs> this is another area. This is a little nuance in the law that I've seen um, some dealers get tripped up on too. Uh, you might have some permanently mounted machinery, um, but you really don't want to have any ability to haul cargo with it so um, you know you got to be careful with that so next slide here kind of dives into a little bit more so any cargo hauling capacity regardless of size weight or frequency in addition to that equipment will fail that test so if you've got a crane on the back of this thing 
and it can pick up pallets of whatever and haul it down the road, that's going to trip the exemption and it's going to be a taxable unit. So again, it has to be solely dedicated to that equipment, no cargo carrying capacity at all. However, they do give you a little bit of leniency on some small areas uh, for tools, clothing, some safety equipment, you know, some small boxes you might hang on it. That's not going to trip it. This is going to be more along the lines of, you know, these crates or pallets of whatever that um, that uh, you might see. And you might see these, uh, you know, you go around town into a Lowe's or Home Depot, and you'll see these forklifts on the back of these trailers on a flatbed. That's not going to meet the mobile machinery. Yes, it can carry that forklift, but guess what? There's pallets of sod, there's pallets of tile and, and rocks and whatever on there too. So that's not a good example of a meeting the mobile machinery exception. So um, this would be more like a, a, tra a trailer that has a large crane and it has zero carrying capacity and it just solely, that trailer, all it does is tote the crane around and it's specially designed. Um, those are going to be the better examples of, of meeting this exemption. Um, again, it requires exclusive use, dedication. Um, here's another thing that I've, I've seen. This was a court case years ago. Um, it's, it's applicable to trucks, but it would be equally applicable to a trailer if you were to do this. But let's say you have an otherwise exempt unit that... Um, meets all the exceptions. It's dedicated to the machinery, it's specially designed, but if you modify that in any way, uh, that chassis to transport, um, let's say equipment or pull something, it's gonna trip that exception. And if you ever get examined, they're gonna look at these to see what you've done here. So here's a good example where you were an electric uh, utility uh, down in Florida, Florida P&L, um, had some otherwise exempt trucks and it had a special design, no problems, e exempt all day. But what they did is they said, well, gosh, we could probably pull some trailers with these trucks. And they attached a pencil hook to it. What that did is they were considered dual use and they were ability, they had the ability to haul cargo at that point in time and it tripped FET and guess what? Florida Power and Light was writing a big check. So be very, very careful with that. Um, you know, you might have an exempt unit today, but if you do something tomorrow to trip that, um, you could be uh, in trouble with the IRS on these. Um, here's some just some broad examples that they list in the code. Um, again, the first one's more of the trucks. These are wireline units like they use down in the oil wells in, in Texas. Uh, they're large, big trucks. Um, that uh, supply power to the the site, the drilling site. Um, they're they're really you know they really couldn't do anything else with these things. Um, uh, I've seen a couple of them, but um, those would be mobile machinery. They carry some the power units, uh, supply, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff to the to the oil uh, industry. Uh, the four wheel undercarriage, uh, no identifiable chassis, was designed just to support an antenna unit. Uh, so that met the, the exemption. There was a low boy semi-trailer chassis that had a steam producing equipment uh, boiler on it. Um, again, nothing you could do really without that, with that trailer dedicated to producing uh, steam. Um, that met the, the requirement. And then uh, some van semi-trailers designed to be uh, a water treatment system. So those are in the code section as examples. I think there's some revenue rulings as, on those as well. Um, but um, those are just, um, you know, probably not very common, but um, good examples of what they look like. So just a couple things, and I can't say this enough, um, just some key concepts to wrap up with here on the mobile machinery. Um, you just have that have to have that permanently mounted machinery equipment unrelated to the transportation must be special designed um, for that equipment and without substantial modification, it couldn't really be used to do anything else with it. So again, um, can't stress this enough as well because I've been in this position with the clients. If you are selling exempt, be prepared to defend your position with the IRS. So make sure you have that documentation in your deal file to support it. All right, so let's switch to off-highway use. Um, this is 
uh, under IRC and Internal Revenue Code 7701A48A. Um, this was put in place back in 2004, I believe. But this um, this changed a lot of things, and I'll get into that at the very end as a good example. But in general, in general, the um, you know you're not going to have you're not going to have a taxable unit if the vehicle is specially designed uh, for transporting a particular type of load, uh, and because of that design, the unit is substantially limited or impaired uh, when it when it does travel. So again, be very careful with this. The IRS will place heavy scrutiny on this. They'll take a narr very narrow look at what qualifies. Um, you will probably be required to uh, submit uh, various designs, engineering, uh, specs, uh, things of that nature. If you do get examined, your own marketing materials will be reviewed um, and they could possibly be used against you. If there's something that contradicts uh, something that you're selling that they find that, gosh, you know, this does, doesn't meet that test. Um, so be careful with that. This is probably the biggest one here. It's not good enough to look at the intended use. And I get calls on this a lot of time on the FET hotline. So in this example, you have a customer that says, well, I'm going to buy a trailer and I'm going to put it, I'm going to run it around my farm or my, or my, you know, business and I'm not going to plate it. Um, it's not going to go on the highway. I'm not going to register it. I'm not going to do anything with it. That doesn't matter. It's not a use test. It's not, um, you know, if you if you um, intend to use it on the highway or not, it's can it um, be used? And if it can, then you have a taxable unit. You have not met the special design test. So um, I get at least maybe five or six calls on that every year. Uh, when you've got a customer asserting they're exempt because of that reason. And um, again, it's just not a use test. Um, <clears throat> you have to prove both of these. And unlike the mobile machinery, these are in order. So you first have to meet the special design test. Once you're good with that, um, then you have to look to the substantial impairment test and understand that you can have something special design, but if it's not impaired, if it can roll down the highway at 50 mile an hour, no restrictions, no chase cars, no uh, you know over height, overweight signs and none of that stuff, or you can run it all times of the year, the day, the night. Um, that's that substantial impairment test is not going to be met. So again, these are prescribed in order. Um, design tests must be met before the substantial impairment test, and um, that's what Internal Revenue Code 7701A48A basically speaks to um, in that section. Um, we talked about this uh, must vehicle trailer must be special design all based upon those physical characteristics and again it's not the intended use of the vehicle it's whether the vehicle purchaser um, you know whether the, the purchaser registers it for the highway actually uses it on the highway does not make any difference and has no bearing on this test um, so can't stress that one enough there are a couple of red, uh, letter rulings out there um, I can send these to you if you want to read through them um, but it's typically applied to oversized vehicles um, in that special design, you know, being over width, overweight, uh, makes them really unsuitable for transporting the load on the highway. Um, these are things that you might see at um, mines or quarries, um, and things of that nature, if you're if you're ever looking for something like these. Um, the the other one here um, is. Um, Another really good one because it, it provides a little more clarity on, well, gosh, if I put some big tires on it and add some oversized, uh, you know, flags or um, throw in some big old mirrors on it, um, that that'll meet it. Nope, it will not. So this one um, basically walks through, you know, making slight modifications of these types of things isn't going to really meet that test. Um, and readily uh, adding detachable components as an axle, you know, that's not going to do it either. So a um, little more clarity was given with this uh, private letter ruling years ago. Um, but uh, just a common question I get as well on, you know, what what do I have to do? Um, so to answer that, um, that special design, here's, here's what the tests 
um, or some questions that you're going to have to navigate through to determine if you meet it. Now, again, meeting one of these is probably not going to be sufficient, but if you meet the bulk of these or um, you know, all of them uh, and, so, and can support it with documentation or research in the file, you're probably going to be okay. So um, really looking at, you know, does it have a standard highway chassis or body? If so, were any modifications made? Um, is it designed to carry a particular load other than over the public highways? And if so, what is it? Is it gigantic boulders? Is it, uh, you know, some type, type of special equipment that's you know, ridiculously large? Um, what are the special design characteristics and, and things of that nature? Is it over width, over height? Um, and if so, you know, what, what are the limitations there? Is it, you know, and then is it really structurally different than a standard highway vehicle? Um, and also, you know, is the vehicle not required to be registered? Um, so again, um, those are probably the biggest special design tests that you need to meet. The second part of this, the substantial impairment test. Now, this is really where I see a lot of um, taxpayers get really caught up on this and really find out they have a taxable unit. So let's say you met the substantial design or the, the special design test. So now we got to look to this one and what we look here is, OK, what's the size of the vehicle? This thing like ridiculously large. Um, is it required to be licensed? Are there safety or other highway requirements that it can or cannot meet? And this is probably one of the biggest ones here is it can it sustain a speed of at least 25 miles an hour? If it can, if it can go 30, you know, over 25, 50, you're probably going to trip this test and it's not going to be applicable. But if it, you think this thing can, it, it, it'll it crawl like a snail on the highway, it can't go over that because it'll overheat or, you know, it just can't move that fast because of what it's carrying, then you probably got a good case. Another revenue ruling uh, was out there that talked about the substantial impairment. And this one, um, again, did a pretty good job of just defining, okay, what, what the heck does this mean? So, you know, it takes this, this revenue ruling took into account whether it can travel at high regular speeds, if it requires a special permit, over height, overweight again, um, and other relevant considerations. So to kind of wrap up on this one, um, here are the questions that you kind of got to meet uh, or the, the tests you got to meet when you're looking at the impairment. So, you know, how is the vehicle substantially prepared? Is it speed or carrying capacity limited on the public highways? Um, is there a larger annual vehicle registration fee uh, that, that the operator has to pay because of this? Is there a special permit, signage, or an escort required for it? Um, if it is required, is it is it attributable or does, um, does the cost increase uh, according to that size of weight? Um, and this is probably one of the biggest ones that I like to, to really hammer on is, um, you know, you can put this on the highway, but can you only do it during certain hours or days or road conditions, weather conditions, months of the year, um, or it can only go certain distances. So if that that's a big restriction, I think, and um, that's the one I generally like to see um, clients meet um, because that one is 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 pretty restrictive, um, and, and along with the the miles per hour requirement. Um, if it uh, if it can travel on on the highway, you know, are there special mirrors, flags, lights, monitoring equipment that it also needs to have? So, again, meeting one of these is not going to be, hey, I met this, I'm good. Um, it's really meeting more um, in, than uh, just a couple of these or just one is going to really support the case for um, exemption. So, again, um, just to wrap up on this one. Um, uh, the highway exemption applies to the entire vehicle. Uh, must be the these features design must be on the chassis and the body, uh, and it must be meet both both tests. Um, the first was which is the design test, and then the impairment test in that order. Um, highway, um, any non-private road, not just the interstates. And again, the biggest thing here: design test is not a use test. So even if it will never be used on the public highway, your customer may tell you that that that's the case, um, it doesn't have any bearing on on this uh, exemption here. So um, <clears throat> I talked about 7701A48A and kind of what it changed a lot. And 
couple of years ago, I I don't know if you guys were selling if pavers were the hot item that year, but I got probably a dozen questions on pavers. And <clears throat> I did some research on it. And years ago, there was a couple of court cases, Flowboy and Gateway, that basically held the asphalt trailers, semi-trailers were not vehicles, highway vehicles, and were exempt. And then <clears throat> October 4, 2004, IRC 771 came, became effective, which basically enacted the statutory definition of what an off-highway vehicle was. Since these cases predate October 4th, 2004, you can't really rely upon these as precedent anymore. So 7701 is now kicked in. Um, based on everything that I've seen, based on my conversation with the IRS, uh, pavers, um, uh, they would now be required to meet that special design and significant impairment test. Um, so they do meet the specially designed test. They definitely carry a particular type of load, um, but it didn't substantially impair its ability to transport. Um, I think they found that these things can travel, um, you know, that oh, more than 25 miles an hour down the road. Um, they, um, nothing in the case really substantiated they were really oversized, um, needed special permits. Um, and so they found, um, you know, these things did not meet 7701, whereas before in Flowboy and Gateway, they did. So um, just be careful if you are selling pavers. I think, in my opinion, um, the IRS will mo most likely deem those as taxable units now. So uh, it's been a while, it's 2004. Um, it's been, this has been out there. So, um, just know if you are selling these, you might want to reconsider if you are selling them exempt now. So um, be aware of that. That is it for today. Um, this is the last webinar that uh, we will have this year. It's the fourth of the uh, series. Um, again, that is my contact information. Please feel free to call me or shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to answer questions, um, help you out provide some guidance or at least get you started in the right direction on something. Um, thank you to Gwen Brown. Gwen's awesome. She's been a great um, help with uh, getting the FET um, um, hotline together and, and getting you guys a good resource for questions and things of that nature. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to all the members. You guys are awesome. I truly enjoy working with every one of you. Uh, it's um, been a lot of fun this year and, and as in the previous years but I always like talking to the members helping them out because there are some things that you will find um, in your daily operations that um, you know gosh this FET is a royal pain and I need a direction on it so I'm always happy to help uh, if you are going to the NTDA conference I will be there um, and I'm speaking I have two sessions back to back on I think it's Thursday on October 5th, I believe they start around 2.30, I think. Please feel free to step in. Um, I will cover best practices, IRS exam tips, and just kind of some general information on um, some common things that I've seen and dealers get tripped up with. So good session. Um, I will try to keep everyone awake, but um, when you're dealing with this stuff, I know it's a little challenge, but um, so with that, um, I've got a little bit of time. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Again, if you would like a copy of the presentation, uh, send me an email, I'll get it to you today. Um, or if you wanna talk to me um, in private, you can give me a call um, and I can um, chat with you um, there too. And again, if you are at the conference, please feel free to pull me aside. Be glad to talk to you and, and um, be a resource for you there as well. So thanks to everybody. Um, and um, let me know if you have any questions. Hey, Tim, I think we did have one question. Someone was asking about uh, triangle signs. Triangle signs. So are these the like the that show like if there's a chemical on board like or something or. I don't know what those are. I mean, I'm just. Is that like a. Um, you know, those, oh, those uh, signs show like farm, a flammable. Farm triangle. Um, Does that make sense? 
you know, I'm trying to I figure think out how to are... unmic every, or how to unmute everybody here so they can yeah. ask questions. Tim, I, I'm thinking they're they're meaning like slow moving vehicle sign, like triangle. Yeah, I think that's still going to be taxable um, because I and I'd have to look to double check it, but I do know the signs, the plates that show like a, a, like the flammable sign or something that's non flammable. I believe those are going to be taxable. So by analogy. I think the caution signs would be taxable as well um, because it, you know, it's basically showing somebody that, hey, there's a, it, it kind of contributes to the transportation function. Now, decals, on the other hand, um, you know, those are exempt, but something that's um, informative or something that um, shows as a warning or something that you know, there's need to be caution, I believe those are going to be taxable. Whoever sent that to me, if they want to send me an email, I I remember re reading through um, a uh, an IRS. I don't know if it was a revenue ruling or. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I actually do build trailers that are primarily designed to haul feed, seed, and fertilizer to and on farms. It's all I build, and I've been audited by the IRS many times, and I am doing it accurately. Um, the only reason I ask about the triangle sign is because from what I've learned over the years is that even though my trailer is built primarily designed to haul feed, seed, and fertilizer, that the chassis portion, no matter what is taxable, is how they make me do it. That's correct. And that, that's that, what I do, but for that same reason, that's why I question the triangle sign, because sometimes I may build, say, a side dump for manure that is only going to be used on the farm, but they'll throw a triangle on it to drive it to me to get repaired or yeah. something, um, and it will have, I will not have given it a VIN number, and it probably doesn't have brakes or lights. Yeah, and... Um... And again, I, I don't I don't think there's anything out there specifically deals with the the triangles, but I'm just thinking from um, and drawing from analogy to the flip signs for the flammable and stuff like that. Um, I that's know that a the, totally different sign. I mean, I, I know what you're talking about, but that's the one that's that. got the numbers on it. And yeah, that's not even the same. Yeah, but and, and again, you probably won't find anything in the code that specifically speaks to triangles. So a lot of times we have to draw from analogy. Well, to... the triangle signs have some laws in the code because I did have one time a CHP follow a triangle trailer right into my yard. And I think a triangle sign is not, they're not supposed to go over 30 miles an hour or something to that effect. I don't know the exact number. Um, and he was going faster than that, which is why he got pulled over. You know what I mean? Sure, but I don't I don't know. I'd have to look in the code. I mean, that's something that's pretty minuscule in the code section. I'd have to go digging for it. But if you if you have it and if it says it's exempt, then it's exempt. I mean, well, the part mine is exempt because they're primarily designed to haul feed and seed and fertilizer turn on farms. But I still usually charge of the frame portion from the frame and, you know, running gear down. And that that's being correct. Said, because that, that being said, on sometimes when they want a side dump that they're going to use only on the farm, I'll build it without brakes and without lights and no no 17 digit VIN number. And um, I don't usually charge FET even on the running gear portion. Yeah, well, the exemption is on the body only in the case. Right. So you can't, I mean, no matter the, what the chassis, whether it's got brakes or not, I don't think they're going to let you off the hook on the FET on that portion. But th that makes it not roadworthy. If I mean, from what I understand, a triangle sign is as good as running on a John Deere. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you, you said you had the code section, so whatever it says, I mean, you know, I think okay, if you put... I, I, I've been doing it a long time, so I'm, I'm pretty good with it, and I've been audited. I just thought I would ask that question when I overheard your talk, and... I thought you would know that. Okay. No, I don't. I don't have much familiarity with those. I just, um, 
I don't think I've ever had that question before, but you know, I could go looking for it. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, Tim, this is uh, Donovan. Uh, uh, can you send me the regulation stating the the regulations for what? I think hey, Donovan, we, lost, we, we can't hear you, Donovan. I think we lost it. <laughs> oh, hey, Tim, can you hear me now? I can. Uh, hey, can you? Oh, good. Uh, can you send send us the regulation stating anything over 30K uh, does get, is taxable? For 30, 30K for? For a trailer, whether it's a tag trailer, utility trailer whatever the case might are you be talk, are you talking about the gvw or yes yeah um send me an um send me an email at that address because i don't have your information uh it's that's code go. section 4051 and it outlines the twenty six thousand pound um requirement i can send that to you not a problem but send me an email and i'll get it Great. to you thank you sir appreciate it i'll yep. connect with you All right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I will let you guys go. Um, if you do have something, um, think of something later this week. Um, my contact information is there. I'd be glad to help you. So thanks again and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.